There's a lot to do about MQA re-releases that have limited bandwidth despite a high sampling rate. This might have to do with the properties of analog recorders, as I mentioned in my video why some MQA 192 kHz files stop at 20 kHz. So let's look at some analog tape recorder properties for better understanding. Almost all analog recordings made since the Second World War are made on tape recorders. They work by magnetizing a magnetic pattern onto a plastic tape covered with ferro-oxide, in essence a sophisticated form of iron rust. Without going into detail too much, I would like to explain those artefacts that are typical of analog tape recorders. Let's start with the recording. The tape is first pulled along a very simple erase head, in essence an electromagnet that is fed with a very high frequency signal and this shakes up the magnetic fields that might already be on the tape in a random way, so erasing the tape. Then it passes to the racket head. This also is an electromagnet but far more delicate. This head creates a magnetic field analogous to the electric signal that represents the audio signal. This varying magnetic field creates a variant magnetic field in the iron oxide on the tape. Unfortunately, the magnetic field radiated by the head is wider at low frequencies. Therefore, the track on the tape will be wider for low frequencies. Later, tape heads got poles in the shape of a butterfly to reduce this effect, but these butterfly heads were not fitted on all tape recorders for they were only suited for stereo recording while for instance timecode for use with video was not possible. The butterfly heads had another advantage, they could write wider tracks without compromising channel separation too much. General purpose tape recorders use 2 mm tracks on a 6.3 mm tape. On this machine the two tracks can each contain a separate mono program. The tape recorder with stereo heads uses a track width of 2.4 mm, mainly at the expense of space between the tracks and thus the channel separation. Since the channel separation is of less importance for a stereo material, this works fine. As an extra bonus, the track width offers about 1.6 dB's extra signal to noise. The butterfly heads write even wider tracks, 2.7 mm, adding another dB to the signal to noise while the special head shape does prevent channel separation to degrade too much. There's another problem with tape heads called head bump. I already mentioned that low frequencies cause a wider magnetic field. This is not only perpendicular to the tape but also in the direction of the tape moves. That can cause a nasty resonance in the lows that depends on the tape speed. In general the head design is made so that the resonance occurs between 40 and 50 Hz at the preferred tape speed. Since we talk professional tape recorders here, the preferred tape speed will often be 38 cm per second, 15 inches per second in the Queen's measure. Tape speed can be chosen higher and lower with a factor of 2. This will also change the head bump up or down with a factor of 2. There were artists that liked recording at 76 cm per second, 30 IPS. That would also shift the bandwidth with a factor of 2, meaning that in theory a bandwidth of 30 to 22,000 Hz would become 60 to 44,000 Hz. Often the playback head and the electronics limited the high end, but more important the head bump would go from say 45 Hz to 90 Hz. The head bump could easily amplify the resonance frequency with 5 dB's on poorer performing machines and still 2 dB's in first class machines. Since it's a resonance, the phase response is poor too. That is why, by nature, analog tape recorders can never sound as solid in the lows as digital recordings. This makes it also interesting to see what MQA can solve here. There's another reason why digital recordings will sound deeper and better controlled in the lows. The 
playback head of an analog tape recorder is almost the same as a recording head, only the head gap is smaller since it need not output magnetic force but rather read it. Given the way the magnetic registration works, the output of the head doubles each octave up. Since we want an output that has an equal output for each frequency, an inverse filter is applied. Here tape recorder manufacturers have to decide what compromise to make between the lowest frequency and the signal to noise ratio. If the filter is applied at 40 Hz, 20 Hz will be 6 dB down but the signal to noise will be 6 dB better than when 20 Hz is chosen, as you can see in this graph. Do realize that about 6 dB signal to noise was common on tape recorders if you want clean recordings. Pop and rock could be modulated higher since in contrast to digital recorders, analog recorders have a very pleasant way of distorting when driven hard. But pop and rock didn't need a dynamic range and even if it did, about 70 dB would be the limit. So choosing 20 Hz as a filter frequency at the expense of 6 dB signal to noise was a bad choice since no speakers then and only a limited number of speakers today would be able to reproduce below 40 Hz. As soon as half the wavelength of the signal on the tape reaches the gap width of the playback head, the output will rapidly drop. It might be clear that optimally the gap of the playback head is chosen so that the 20 kHz bandwidth defined by the DIN Institute as upper frequency for hi-fi could easily be played at the highest tape speed on the machine. The better studio machines I have measured over time often got slightly over 20 kHz. This means that when you digitize a tape at a higher sampling rate, you will still see a rapid dropping of the output above 20 to 22 kHz. Tape recorders can sound amazing, impressive and emerging because of the qualities that were and perhaps are still hard to achieve on digital media at 44.1 or 48 kHz. Not for the limiting frequency range since a tape recorder doesn't do a better job, but for the reasons I mentioned in my video the truth about Nyquist and why 192 kHz does make sense. In short, we are not able to band limit a signal to 20 kHz as needed for 44.1 kHz sampling without causing severe time smearing that is most noticeable in the mid range, something an analog tape recorder does a good job in. Tape recorders can't produce ultra deep lows and have a limited signal to noise ratio. There also can be a heap of other problems like modulation noise, that's noise that varies with the signal, woe and flutter and all kinds of mismatching due to standards. As with all analog storage and transmission equipment, the signal is shaped to fit inside the medium. In almost all cases the high frequencies are boosted prior to the medium to be attenuated with the same amount when playing out the signal. This also reduces the noise the medium has ad added and is therefore sometimes called passive noise reduction. For tape recorders this principle is also used. Unfortunately there are both consumer and pro standards and for each there is a European and a US version. In Europe we have the ISC setting the norm for professional parts driven by the European Broadcasting Union, the EBU. I forgot who was responsible for the consumer standards in the States, but the professional standards were set by the North American Broadcasters, the NAB. A tape with the ISC equalization will not sound correct when played back on a machine using NAB EQs and vice versa. Playing back a tape with the correct EQ but with the wrong tape head, say a tape with 2 mm tracks played back on a machine with 2.7 mm poles will produce a faulty frequency curve in the lows. Then there are tapes at severe tape speeds, types of spools, wound tails out or not and so on. The tails out is yet another nice granddad story. If you load a reel of tape by putting it on the left teller to be wound onto the right spool, you make your recording, spool the tape back onto the left reel and store it, 
chances are that after a few years you will hear a faint echo in front of the music, indeed a pre-echo. This was caused by the transfer of magnetic load from one layer to the next. It was a real problem until someone found out that when you didn't spool back the tape after recording but stored it on the right spool, so with the tail out, the print through would be after the original and thus hard to hear and when heard more natural than a pre-echo. Didn't we have pre-echoes with digital as well? Yes, but they are not audible as separate echoes. I hope you found this interesting. Please let me know either way so I can an anticipate on what to discuss in my next Patreon special video. For I do appreciate your support immensely and I really want to give you some extras. Again, I hope you have enjoyed it and I hope you will enjoy listening to music even more. See you in the next video. The output will rapidly, rapidly drop.